you very warm welcome. Really happy to be here and discussing Wi-Fi, something very close to me for the past 10 years and a big part of uh, Skyward's story. Uh, so a little bit about myself, I've uh, been involved in Wi-Fi Skyward's for 10 years. Started as a PA designer doing a lot of linear PAs for our access point products and now work together to manage a team uh, doing all the front end modules for access points. Uh, and developing all the products for Wi-Fi 6, Wi-Fi 7, and even discussions into Wi-Fi 8 that I'll talk about a little bit today. Uh, but, you know, let's focus on Wi-Fi 7 uh, right now, so I'll talk a little bit about the specs and how it changed between Wi-Fi 6 and Wi-Fi 7. Uh, the big interest to me on this talk is really how the new specs uh, have implications on the technology and the design techniques and being successful with our partners to give the best performance. And then I'll touch on Wi-Fi 8 goals and a little bit on future trends in the industry. Uh, so something I really love, uh, there's a group called the Wi-Fi Alliance, which publishes a lot of really nice information and infographics and educates the world about Wi-Fi. And really, you know, proud of this. This is a big part for, for Skyworks, but the one I want to point to here is 4.1 billion annual device shipments with Wi-Fi. That's incredible, right? And I know a lot of people in this room are a big part of that, uh, working together to make this successful. So that's really need to see really makes me happy, right? And then when you look at, you know, where we've been to, to where we are today, right, I think everyone remembers those old wireless routers. That's like, okay, this is cool, but it's maybe a bit slow, right? And then 2010, you know, a little bit faster, you got the five gig rolling in, it's quite serviceable, right? And now you look at a wireless router and it kind of looks like a spaceship, right? 12 antennas, uh, aimed at gamers, it can do everything, MIMO, uh, Wi-Fi 6, 6 e 7, end-to-band, even some cellular support at times, power over internet, uh, GPS, cell phones, so, you know, everything into one box. We really need to see, you know, where we've been and where we're going, right? Uh, so what's new with Wi-Fi 7 relative to Wi-Fi 6 and 6E? So I just put some of the top features here. Uh, the big one is the faster speed, right? The faster maximum throughput for eight spatial streams. Uh, and this really comes from the doubling again of the bandwidth. So for Wi-Fi 6E a few years ago, they opened up the 5.9 to 7.125 channel, and they added seven 160 megahertz watts channels, right? And everyone's excited about this. It's the new information sort of super highway. There's none of this noise around the 5 gig band. There's no block in the 5 gig band anymore. That's restricted. We have this huge one gig span of bandwidth that can send a lot of information. And now we're going to double the channel bandwidth as well. So 160 to 320 for Wi-Fi 7, so even faster, so you get a twice speed increase. And then we're also going to increase the modulation over from 1K POM to 4K POM. That also adds 20% more data. So you know 20% plus two times the bandwidth, uh, you get 2.4 times that faster. And then the other really interesting piece of this is multi-link operation. And I'll talk a little bit more there, but that's, I think, the most interesting one for Wi-Fi 7, and it has a lot of implications on our architectures and our technology uh, at the same time. Actually, sorry, before that, I just wanted to point out just all the channels up here I discussed earlier, right? So the seven new channels for Wi-Fi 6E, right? And then the three 20 link channels as well over there. We can send a lot of data quite reliably, quite uh, quickly. Okay, so, you know, what's, what's multi-link? So multi-link essentially allows us to send more than one signal over different frequencies at the same time. So this has to be at least two, right? And it can be simultaneous or non-simultaneous, depending on the application. But this is really important for Wi-Fi. So instead of having two dedicated radios, it's one radio and two devices connecting. You know, an example here, you can five gig and six gig signal, both transmitting, receiving at the same time and sending a lot more information. This is really neat because not only can you increase the amount of information you're sending, right? You're, you know, two, five, and six gig, a lot of channels in there you can send it. But it can also be used for more critical applications where you can send redundant data, right? So let's say you're doing a remote surgery in the future, the doctor somewhere else offered a machine and that, that link cannot break. You can send, you know, some of the data over two, some of the data over five. Uh, you're not gonna glitch out, it's gonna add the reliability for that connection as well. The other big one is for gamers, actually. So I know a lot of gamers, I have a lot of co-op students, a lot of young designers who are gamers, they will still plug in and not use Wi-Fi, right? One of my personal goals is to make sure they buy a Wi-Fi 7 router and improve there, because they can do two, five, and six gigs, send all the information at the same time. If they have a blocker, you know, like they did for maybe Wi-Fi 5 or Wi-Fi 6, 
uh, there's no switching overhead to find another channel and reestablish your connection, right? So this really matters a lot to people. It's much more robust, it's faster. Uh, but how do we get this to work? And this is where we see a lot of the evolution of our filters here. So, you know, Skyworks has a big interest in BAW and SAW filters, but BAW at the higher frequency is really paying a key part of the story uh, for getting Wi-Fi 7 and all over work. But you can imagine, here's just a simple example, again, a 5 and a 6 gig link together. Uh, if you were trying to receive on the 5 and the 6 gig is transmitting, you can't get that signal received back in and desensitizing your domain, right? So you can imagine that's only a simple example. Imagine doing, you know, tri-band, quad-band, and even some discussion here of end-to-band. So as we move forward, I still think we're in the early innings of Wi-Fi 7. As MLO becomes more and more popular, you're going to see many more adventurous architectures, and these are really enabled by high-performance filters uh, that you can use. So that's, that's a neat thing to see, and certainly a big step uh, and a big need for filters that we've seen before in the previous generation. So market adoption for Wi-Fi 7, right? So, you know, a bit of a marketing slide. So yeah, the speed increase, that's gone faster and faster. A little teaser for Wi-Fi 8 over there. But where are we? I mean, if you walk through Best Buy now, you'll see two or three Wi-Fi 7 routers, right? Again, this is you know, Wi-Fi Alliance. And we're certainly seeing now that, you know, our big, big product push is Wi-Fi 6 and 6E. That's still taking a lot more. Uh, but Wi-Fi 7 is coming, right? And what are some of the drivers that are going to make people buy and upgrade to Wi-Fi 7 over Wi-Fi 6 and 60. So the current drivers are pretty obvious, right? This is your home router, watching Netflix, 8K. Uh, I mentioned gaming. Uh, another one is really working from home, right? So when COVID first hit a few years back, we had that free router that comes with your internet. That's always full of sort of the cheapest parts they can get sometimes, right? So my wife's working from home, she's doing video streaming, I'm working video streaming. Uh, it all falls apart very quickly, right? So you go to the store, I buy a brand new, I think it was a Wi-Fi 6 router. I was pretty happy about it because it had some of my designs in it. Uh, plug it in, problem solved, you know, full of harmony. So you know, you guys have families, more people working closer together, buy a Wi-Fi 7 router, uh, you know, have peace in, in the house. And then what are some of the, the future drivers here, right? Automotive is a big, big push, right? The connected car is a big deal. More and more discussion on factory automation for robustness, for low latency, that matters. IoT smart home, right? The big thing I see anyway from that is a lot of those ring doorbells or connected doorbells to make sure your Amazon packages are in there on time. And then finally, you know, remote education, training, remote surgeries, you know, uh, becoming more and more connected there and bringing the world together for that. So those are just some of the ones, you know, that's gonna push Wi-Fi 7 forward. And then this, I think this is my favorite slide, right? This is the, the fight that I'm fighting. Uh, every time you know, our marketing comes up, the system team with the new generation. Uh, what does the new spec for Wi-Fi 7, what did that mean to us? How did we get to, to you know, the performance that we needed to for Wi-Fi, right? So mainly with the uh, wider bandwidth and higher data rate, this puts a lot of pressure on the TX side, right? So I've got some constellation diagrams there from Wi-Fi 5 to Wi-Fi 6 to Wi-Fi 7. Uh, right, and you can see that those demodulated signals are getting much, much closer together for Wi-Fi 7. Right, so if the PA in your Wi-Fi system distorts that signal, uh, you're going to get an error, it's going to have to go back to the lower data rate, and you're not going to get the throughput you need. Right, so that's measured in something called error vector magnitude, sort of the distance between where you thought that you were going to demodulate the signal and where it actually wound up. And this is a little slide, I stole this from our sort of designer training for Welcome to Wi-Fi and Linear Design Parts. But uh, I've just got a family of curves here. So there's different target EVM levels or dynamic EVM levels uh, for, for different generations of Wi-Fi. So minus 35 for Wi-Fi 5, minus 43 for Wi-Fi 6, and then minus 47 for Wi-Fi 7. And if you told me 10 years ago we'd be designing to that level, I would never have believed you. But uh, these, these different colored curves, the red curve is essentially a perfect amplifier with no phase or amplitude distortion. The blue curve is 0.1 dB of amplitude distortion, and you can see we're already in trouble. And then as you go forward, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and you're done, and you don't have a Wi-Fi 7 PA. Uh, on top of that, not only do we have to have almost these perfect PAs, but for Wi-Fi, we're turning that part on and on. So not only there's EVM, there's something called dynamic EVM. And at the bottom left here, there's a plot 
that shows what the gain delta has to be between the preamble at the beginning of the burst versus the pilot tones throughout the burst uh, before your noise floor gets too high, right? And this is a big challenge for us because everyone, you know, PA designers, you turn on a PA, it gets hot, the gain drops, uh, you have problems, right? So if you want to get a part that does minus 47, uh, you really have to be below minus 50, which is about 0.04 dB over temperature, frequency, bandwidth, uh, so a lot of work, a lot of craftsmanship has gone, on to, uh, has gone into this at Skyworks. Uh, certainly a huge family of patents and pushing our technology team uh, to be able to yield that, right? On the receive side, uh, a little bit more complexity we see for Wi-Fi 7, so they've added some mid-gain states, not only a bypass and high gain, uh, with some linearity requirements with received dynamic EVM. And then the other big one is really the uh, coexistence for MLO, right? For simultaneous transmit receive especially. Uh, filters, isolation, uh, that was a big, big push, a big, big deal for us, uh, getting the best filters we can out to the market to work with our friends and give the best solution uh, for the customer. Uh, a few more complexity, you know, complexity coming into states, DPD, I'll touch on that a little bit later, efficiency, and finally, I, I think the big one that gets overlooked a little bit is modeling and simulation, and that was really, Wi-Fi 7 really changed the game for us. This started in 6 and 6E, but to get to these levels of linearity, especially on the transmit and isolation, uh, you know, we had to do a lot of work uh, to make sure we got there. So the first one is how do you model a, a wideband signal and make sure you can get to the EVM floor? Uh, how do you model with isolation? How do you view this over process is actually something that goes, uh, you know, it's a detail that goes overlooked oftentimes, right? So you can get a part that can do minus 47 dynamic EVM on the bench, but now can you ship it 10 million times, right? So that's really, uh, was a lot of work into that. And the guys have done a great job on sharpening our pencils and uh, making us yield for, for Wi-Fi 7. So what are some of the technology trends, right? I touched on this uh, filter integration more and more. So I just have a plot here. These are our two latest Skyworks filters for five and six gig Wi-Fi. And you can see the super sharp roll off at the band edges that allow for coexistence, co coexistence right? That's I think 50 dB rejection in about 100 megahertz span, uh, which is really neat to see. Another big push that we're seeing is uh, DPD, especially for Wi-Fi 7. So we started releasing DPD parts for, for access points uh, in Wi-Fi 6, 6E. Uh, market adoption, I think, was still 50-50. For Wi-Fi 7, we have a family of linear products, we have a family of DPD products. The DPD is starting to take over, right? And that's understandable. Uh, people want to stick power. People want to generate less heat, and they want to save uh, money on the heat spreader as well. So it's a big deal, and I think that's really going to push us forward. Finally, the technology mix, right? So to get to those high linearity, high performing fans, uh, every single bit of the technology needs to be optimized, right? Even down to the package, down to those SMTs, right? I talked a little bit about process variation. Uh, you know, very tightly controlled SMTs, uh, high SRFs. As you get into the seven gigs or so, that starts to matter as well. So really optimizing everything there. And then advanced packaging, right? So isolation, thermals, uh, SMT integration, right? Process variation, layer to layer registration for couplers and DPD training. Uh, again, these are all things that are gonna matter more and more, not only for Wi-Fi 7, but as we get to, to Wi-Fi 8 as well. So DPD, this is definitely the, the next big trend uh, for Wi-Fi. Again, I touched, it's been supported since Wi-Fi 6. Uh, it's a big deal in Wi-Fi 7, uh, and you know, people want to save power, right? So you can save about 30% of power for now uh, with our Wi-Fi 7 parts that are DPD instead of linear. Uh, that's great, there's a need for higher efficiency, right? We all want to be more green, right? I see even on the semi-con badge here, there's a little tree, right? It's just great, we want to be more eco-friendly. That matters a lot to people. And what is DPD for those of us who are a little bit new to this? Essentially what we can do is we can take a a PA that is not particularly linear, and what the customer will do is they'll train on that signal, and then in their baseband, they can generate a signal that cancels out the distortion of the PA. And when you put those together, you get a very, very linear response down here with a very nice, perfect hockey stick, only really, really you know, limited by the saturation power of the PA. So that's a big deal for us, it's coming. Uh, and I don't think it's going anywhere soon. And I would suspect for Wi-Fi 8, we'd probably be only DPD and not very many linear parts. 
which for me is a little bit sad because we spent a lot of time uh, cracking the code for, for the near PAs. But for Wi-Fi 8, I think it's going to be mostly DVD. So what is Wi-Fi 8 uh, going to bring? Right. So I have a little picture here uh, of the project uh, project access request for Wi-Fi 8 and what they want to do. Right. So what are the goals? The first one is, not a surprise, faster speed. OK, 25% even faster, improved efficiency, uh, a couple of other things on robustness, reliability. But this is where it gets a little bit not strange, maybe a little bit uncomfortable, right? Max bandwidth, 320. Well, wait a minute. Didn't we go from 80 to 160 to 320? I thought we were going to go, you know, a little bit excited, a little bit nervous maybe of 640, but no, we're not doing 640. Okay. You know, 4K clock, are we going to go to 8K clock? No, we're not going to do that. So that's the same. H visual streams, no change. MLO, most of the same. But we are going to extend the upper end of the band by 100 megahertz. That's a little bit, I don't know, a little bit strange, right? So the, the higher speed, I think they're going to try and get that through some new modulation techniques where they can send both higher order and lower order modulation at the same time. So that's uneven. I think it's UEFAM, uneven modulation. And then they're also going to improve some, uh, uh, some stuff on the receive side for error correction to get better receiving. But where we can help a little bit for Wi-Fi 8 is this guy right here if I can name this thing properly, improved efficiency, right? And this is more and more coming, you know, it's the DPD story, it's the Wi-Fi 8 story, and I think we're really in the early innings of DPD, right? Right now we have to balance sort of our amplifiers and making them not fully, you can't just put in any amplifier and DPD will fix it, so you have to have some quasi-linear characteristics there, and there's some craftsmanship about having an amplifier that DPD can correct. But as DPD gets more and more popular, as we get into maybe memory DPD instead of just you know lookup tables and polynomial fits, uh, I think the amplifiers are going to get more and more efficient as well, right? And that's the big, big trend that I see, especially on the TX side. So, you know, what's next? For, from what I see, more and more content integration. So we talked about filters. Uh, right now, we sort of sell dedicated FEMs for the five and six gig channels two gig channels, are we going to see parts that combine more and more together for pentaband allegations, that all one module? I suspect some reconfigurability to start happening as well uh, from that perspective. Uh, the next one I just touched on is a big deal, right? DPD is really here to stay. Uh, so more and more elaborate architectures really pushing our technology teams uh, to get the most efficiency we can, right? I met one of our wafer suppliers here earlier, we're going to push them for for a little bit better of an FE, we're going to push our SMT vendors for a little bit less loss. We're going to push our packaging vendors uh, to have maybe a thicker copper and lower loss there, and really pushing the efficiency as far as we can. Uh, and then, yeah, technology push, technology for faster. Again, custom optimization. And then, what's going to come after Wi Fi 8, right? And to be honest, for me, I need a break, right? Wi Fi 7 was a lot. So, Wi Fi 8, we're already talking about it. We got to slow down. But something that keeps happening is you know, millimeter relief. And this is, you know, I think they wanted it to be part of Wi-Fi 8, then they started a, an investigation committee to see if it's useful or not. This is something I think we have to be careful about, right? Uh, cellular did this. I'm not sure how popular it is at the moment. I know it created a lot of stress for some people and the NRE is quite high. So if we're doing it, we sort of all have to be on board together. It can't be just one or two individuals. Uh, the other one is 3GPP just announced, I think, that they're also going to look at the six gig spectrum as well, right? So in the future, are we going to have some sort of handoff between cellular and Wi-Fi, maybe some converged standards, so that's something to watch. And then finally, last point here, you know, I'd be silly not to mention AI, right? It's a big theme of the conference, but likely some sort of training or machine learning of Wi-Fi traffic that we can all optimize that together and improve our systems uh, as well. So yeah, that's uh, all I have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Peter, for the great talk. So now the floor is open for questions. Yes, please. Thanks uh, for a very interesting talk. But I think uh, from technology point of view, the Wi-Fi 7 for you know the device HPD technology pre pretty much reached a very uh, uh, stringent linearity requirement already. So you have to use the uh, DPD to linearize it. 
and going into the Wi-Fi A similar, you have to rely on that, right? Yes. And so that's being said, uh, technology-wise, pretty much uh, going to the uh, hit a little bit for for the Wi-Fi. So do you think uh, you know there is any convergence with the uh, the 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 the, the FR3 type of uh, millimeter wave application in in cellular uh, conversion into you know pretty much a one format. Yeah, so I can talk intelligently about the first one, maybe not the, the millimeter way, but every time we got a new spec for Wi-Fi, we'd always say, well, we can't do that, right? And all the designers would complain and whine and bellyache, but we do have an advantage that we have two high-performing gas fans within Skyworks, uh, working to make it more and more linear, using more and more advanced design techniques and modeling to get there. But absolutely, below minus 47 is difficult, right? Because to yield minus 47 and put that on the data sheet, you really got to be at minus 50. Uh, so that's tough. And then the dynamic effects where we have a ton of IP, uh, you're, you're there, right? And the other one is, you know, modern test equipment has a lot of trouble measuring to those levels, right? Even our lab, you know, we've got a million dollar equipment set up. Uh, five years ago, the floor was minus 44, and they specified minus 47. So absolutely at a limit, I think DPD can fill the gap. One thing I didn't mention with DPD though, that I think plays to a little bit of our advantage is it does not fix transient game effects, right? So the cellular standard has uh, amplitude tracking, the Wi-Fi standard does not. And we've put a lot of work into patents, optimizing the technology to get that game flatness over temperature, duty cycle, burst length, and with voltage. So I'm happy that that's sticking around, but you're probably right. Uh, you know, it's time to get a little bit of help from DPD. Yes, please. Yeah, uh, the Wi-Fi 7 with uh, uh, 4,000 uh, claim uh, with the repeat scheme, uh, the very similar question, uh, even with the uh, distortions, uh, how many back of the power amplify on the situation point? This first one. The second one, uh, you have mentioned you haven't mentioned how to realize it. Who is interested in getting the constant HPT or you will you consider the gain devices of the same carbide? Because I assuredly it should have a better linearity. Thank you. Yeah, good, great questions. I heard GAN, the second one, so I'll do that first. So I've spent eleven years in a clean room working on GAN for my PhD uh, as a young person. Uh, it would make me very happy to see my two worlds collide together. Uh, right now, GAN is sort of more aimed at a little bit higher power, right? So the RPAs have you know saturated powers, one, two, three watts. Uh, they're operated uh, 7 dB, 10 dB backed off, depending on the order of modulation. That's not really GAN's strike zone at the moment, uh, unfortunately. Maybe some room for GAN on silicon even there. Uh, and then in terms of linearity for GAN, uh, one of the challenges I think you'll see maybe is some memory problems as the bandwidth goes wider and wider, right? So you see some of these GAN AM to AM curves, it's, you know, it's a perfect square, and you think, oh, this is the most linear technology in the world, and do high power, it's great. And then you go measure the EVM, and it doesn't cooperate as much as you think there. So I think there's some underpinning technology challenges maybe with the tracking there that need addressing before we see it. Yes. Okay, follow to the previous question. I think that you mentioned about the for the Wi-Fi seven, the linearity and the efficiency is very important. But you comment about the PA for the <coughs> DVD. So how about the switch? Because if you have a, 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 a steering during the Wi-Fi wi seven, so how about the transition time and the linearity? Uh, any conflict or limitation from uh, switch? Absolutely. So I'm a PDA designer, so I kind of ignore the receive guys because we all think our jobs are harder than the other person. Uh, switch linearity matters, right? Switch power handling uh, matters. The switch load impedances uh, matter quite a bit. And then there's a lot of art in receive side dynamic EVM that also has to switch and be below minus 45, minus 47 to receive the signal. So absolutely, I apologize for ignoring all of the switch designers maybe in this room, right? Uh, more of a PA guy, but they do have a, a, have a challenge as well. Yeah. All right, the last question. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, my question is about the AI-assisted DPD. 
Uh, I read a lot of paper there, so uh, they say that uh, AI will improve the ability of uh, DPD, uh, this kind of uh, linearization technique. And my question is, uh, how do you think this kind of AI-assisted linearization technique will affect the requirement of the foreign margin, especially for foreign? Okay, so I think the question is how AI is going to improve DPD and we can leverage that. Yeah, yeah. So. That's not really my strike zone. Uh, we are going to see a lot of growth in that, right? Right now, uh, our partners are using more lookup table, maybe polynomial fit. In the future, I, you know, with more access to data, I suspect it could improve. But yeah, I don't have a great feel for it at the moment. Right? Okay, thank you.